So this is Saturday and we're studying Revelation. We're going to start chapter three today. We are, you, you remember um, in chapter one, uh, right near the end, I think it's 19, but I'm not sure, verse 19, that gives the outline uh, for the whole book. Write the things which you have seen, which is chapter one. He had just seen a, a vision of the glorified Christ. Then he said, write the things that are. That's the church age, all right? And that's where we are now in chapter two and three. Covers the church age right down to the end. And then starting with chapter four, it will be the things that are after the church age. But here, today we're going to start with the church of Sardis. All right, remember uh, these churches, first of all, are exactly what Jesus saw. He's the one that chose these seven churches that more or less form a circle, all right, if they were seen on the map. They actually existed at the time that John the Beloved was here on earth, all right. Jesus was already um, glorified, risen on the right hand of the Father. And Jesus chose these seven churches as a type and a picture of what the whole church age would be like. So the second thing is they're not only talking about the literal church, they're talking about the different ages of the church. And they flow in that same way. Ephesians, Smyrna, Pergamos, and now we're doing number four, uh, which is Sardis, all right? And it means a remnant or an escaped few, all right? Now, not only does it talk about those in the day of John, it was those literal seven churches and the condition in those churches at that time, which was a picture and a type of the church age, all right? But also, thirdly, as it says, let him that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. So it's talking to each and every one of us. We're in the last one. We're in the last of the church age, which is the Laodicean uh, church, all right? But in this time, the last church period, there are all these seven types of Christians represented. So each time we talk about one of these churches, we need to pay attention. It's part of it's historical, yes, it's all historical but part of it is prophetic. It's talking to you and me, whereby we will learn from their mistakes and we will learn from their good points and, and learn lessons for our own life. Um, God wants us to open our ears to hear, all right? Um, at the time that Jesus spoke these words to John, that means uh, at the literal time of those seven churches, the ancient city of Sardis had seen its best days and had begun to decline, all right? It was a wealthy city. Uh, Sardis actually is the first place where the modern money or coinage began. It started right there and it was known, it had a reputation, all right, um, for easy money there. The, the, the road and how to get easy money, it was all located in that area. Um, it also had a reputation for apathy and immorality. The combination of this easy money and loose morals made the people of Sardis soft, pleasure-loving, and they loved luxury, all right? 
that this is a very poor combination. We're talking about the literal city in the day of John. They were so confident of their natural uh, defenses that they felt there was no need to keep a diligent watch, all right? The city of Sardis actually stood high above the valley of Hermas and was surrounded by deep cliffs, these steep cliffs, all right? For them, it was cliffs going down. But for people that wanted to go up, they, they almost looked like impossible cliffs. And yet, because of their overconfidence, all right, um, they were defeated two different times. One of them, it was quite an interesting story. Uh, I can't remember now which king it was. It seems to me it was Cyrus, but if I'm wrong, maybe you can go look it up. Uh, he, you know, when he saw it, it just looked impossible to be able to get up those cliffs. So whoever the king was at that time uh, that was wanting to get into Sardis, he offered reward money to whoever figured out a way whereby they could, you know, succumb this terrible thing and be able to get troops up there and take over the city. Now this one man watched them very carefully from below, watch. And it was right into the night. And he saw one of the men who should have been on guard. He lost his helmet. It, it, it fell down and it came tumbling down. And pretty soon as he kept watching, that man came over the wall and there was a hidden trail and he came down that trail and was able to get his helmet and then go back up. All this was watched by this one man. And I believe it was that very next night, he took, he was a soldier in the army and he took the, a, a batch of soldiers because he had seen where that hidden trail was and he brought them up and that was the first time they were defeated. They were defeated again a second time because they were overconfident and didn't feel like they needed to watch. And if you will realize as we go along in this, uh, where Jesus speaks, he tells this church, they need to watch. They need to watch. So what he, uh, each church is dealt with in a way that w w applies to us as well. And we, we should never be overconfident, no matter how long we've known the Lord or been a member of the family of God, where we think we don't have to be on guard and watch. And this church is going to remind us of that. Now let's start on our notes, all right? Sardis, as it says, means remnant or an escaped few. The meaning, those who have escaped or come out, a, a remnant, that means just a, a, a leftover part, all right? And of course, it's referring in church history to the Reformation period, which was about 1517 AD. Um, after Christ, all right, uh, it was as good, this is what our notes say, as good as far as it went, but it stopped far short and did not restore to the apostolic pattern. If you remember when we talked about the church in Thyatira, we said that historically in church history, it referred to the dark ages when really everything that they didn't really know the Lord, there might have been a few that really knew him, but the majority weren't allowed to read the Bible and so forth. All right. Uh, so these are the ones that come out of that. All right. I want us to see B, his 
address or the address that he, when he addresses this church, you remember to each church, the way he appeared to John in that vision, it describes Jesus to a T, all right? Describes his eyes, describes his uh, features, you know, his feet, his leg, every part he is described. And to each church, he will reveal himself in a special way. Uh, here he describes himself and his character really as the master of every spiritual power and authority, all right? Uh, it says, he which has, I, I'm, I'm going to ask Sister, if she will read this verse one to us, all right? Yes. Revelation three, verse one. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis, write, these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Yeah. So that hath, the seven spirits of God. So Jesus here, uh, he holds the fullness of the spirit of God. Seven is always in the Bible. Uh, the number means completion, perfection, or reaching the fullness, meaning the fullness, all right. Perfection, not in the sense of uh, no sin, but rather completed, perfected, all right. And he says, unto the angel of the church of Sardis, right? The things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. So you go down to number five. You will see there. One shows the seven spirits of God and one having the seven stars. All right. Um, Sardis needed this, all right? They needed the ministry of the Holy Spirit in its fullness. And I'm, we're going to start here and read some portions of scripture, all right, that you and I might realize who we are in Christ and what we have in Christ. So let's talk about Christ having the fullness of God. 1 Corinthians 1, 4, 5, 7, and 9. Okay. 1 Corinthians 1, starting from verse 4. I thank my God always concerning you. Oh, sorry. Let me just change. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God, which is given you by Jesus Christ. Let's stop for a minute. What is the grace of God? It's something we don't deserve. Yes, favor that is not deserved. But really, in reading through the whole Bible and everywhere that it talks about grace, grace is the very life and ability of God. That's what it is. You and I do not deserve it as people who have sinned. And yet, through Jesus, we receive God's life, God's ability, whatever it is that we cannot do, God supplies what he can do or what he knows. And it says this grace of God is given you by Jesus Christ. So when you receive Jesus Christ, you literally receive it's like a bank account that is open for you with all the wealth and riches of God made available to you as you need it in your life. As you draw on it, it is released to you in your life. Go ahead, five. That in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. Verse 7, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9, 
God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. All right. Now it says we receive this grace by Jesus. All right. The life of God is open to us. It says that in everything, there are no exceptions, my friend. It says in everything, we are enriched by him. Then it says two ways, in all utterance, whatever needs to come out of us, whether it's words, whether it's deeds, whether it's actions, all right, whatever you and I need to do or say, all right, and in all knowledge, whatever we don't know, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, whatever we need to take in. So let's read that again. In everything, you are enriched by him whether it's what you have to give out or whether it's what you have to take in, all right? In everything, it, no exceptions at all, all right? It says so that while we're waiting for Jesus Christ to come back, we will fall behind in no gift. Everything we receive from God is a gift. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. I don't care how long you've been a child of God. I don't care how many years you have served him. All right. You still don't deserve anything. Everything he gives to us is a gift and we need to appreciate it. Thank him for it. Praise him for it. Acknowledge it. It has nothing to do with our smartness our wisdom our ability at all all right it's all taken from him so that we come behind and no gift that you know people say you need to seek god to find out what your gift is well I, i've begun to realize now yes you can have one gift but you can have anything that you need on the spot whatever it is Whatever you have need of, make a cry and a demand on the Lord, all right, by faith, and you will have it. So it says God is faithful. He, he's the one that called us into this fellowship, sharing, having a partnership with Jesus Christ, being one with Jesus, all right, being put into Jesus, having a share and having a part in everything that Jesus has. So I, I don't know if that bless you, but it blesses me every time I think about it. So it, it means that whatever it is, I can cry out to the Lord and know he will undertake for me and meet my need. All right. Uh, the next thing is Colossians 2, 3 and 4 then eight to 10, then 18 and 19. Yeah. Colossians two, verse three and four. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Verse eight to 10. Beware, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. All right. So, you know, this word spoil and beguile. All right. You can um, substitute the word rob. All right. I say lest any man should rob you, all right? Because it says, in him, in Jesus dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. No matter what God can do, no matter what he knows, no matter what he possesses, it's all found in Jesus and through Jesus, all right? And we are complete in Jesus. That means outside of Jesus, we don't need to look here, there, everywhere for an answer. Our answer can be found in Jesus Christ himself. 
and he is head over all the principality and power. Uh, that first verse three, in whom, in Jesus, because uh, um, we just, uh, in whom, that's in Christ, in Jesus, are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, all right? So if you don't know how to do something, when to do it, where to do it, why to do it, all right? And there's something you just don't understand and know. If you really seek God, he'll make sure that you know. One way or another, he'll make sure that he reveals it to you. Let's go now to 18 and 19. Colossians 2, verse 18 and 19. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with increase of God. Again, it uses that word beguile. Don't let anybody rob you of your reward. You know, in the book of Revelation, especially these two chapters, second and third, to him that overcometh will I do this. You know, he tells the reward. If you're an overcomer, if you do it the way God wants and you overcome the deceit, the lies of the enemy, the backlash of the enemy, you overcome it at the very end, you will be rewarded. And so here he says, don't let anybody rob you of your reward. There's another portion of scripture that says, be careful, let no man take your crown. It's saying the same thing, but in different words, let no man take your crown. The Lord is going to crown us uh, at the very end, and each of us that our overcomers will receive a crown from the Lord. And here it's saying, don't let any man, it, don't let anybody through their talk and through their ideas and whatever it is, cheat you and rob you from getting your reward by getting your eyes off of Jesus, who has everything that you and I need and turning us away. If you do this, if you do that, if you learn this, if you learn that, if you study this, if you study that, no, just keep your eyes on Jesus and learn to know him more. Ask for that revelation of him to continually being revealed to you of who you are in him and what he has for you. And you will find, praise the Lord, that you will come out and overcomer. Praise the Lord. All right, um, let, let's go on to number three under B. All right, Christ, the fullness of God. The seven spirits of God show that he has the fullness of God's spirit in him. All right, um, and here's another verse that speaks in the same way. Zechariah 4, 6. Zechariah 4, verse 6. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. It's not position. It's not power. It, it's not, um, you know, something in this world where if you arrive at this spot, no, no, no. God says it's by my spirit. And Jesus has the fullness of the spirit. And uh, there's nothing lacking. He's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All right. The spirit is life. All right. The breath of God made man a living soul. And it's the spirit of God that's needed to rejuvenate. You see, this church was on a decline. All right. It is not in comparison to the beginning, Ephesus, it's not, it's already 
uh, fallen short of from way in the beginning. All right. And even though they came out of the church of that time, came out of popery, all right, and um, they, they represent the Protestant that came out, all right, but this is showing that the Protestants, just because they're a Protestant doesn't make them what God wants. <coughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All right, the, the fourth one, the seven, we're talking about the seven still, all right. This is found in Zechariah 3, 9. Zechariah 3, verse 9. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts. And I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. That stone is definitely pointing to Jesus, that foundational stone, all right? Joshua was the high priest. On that one stone on Jesus will be seven eyes. This is the all-knowing. He knows everything. There's nothing that can be hidden from his eyes, all right? And Zechariah 4.10 uh, refers to the eyes of the Lord. Sorry, I was on mute. Zechariah 4 verse 10. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. Yeah. So th th this is, uh, you know, the seven spirits of God. Uh, in another place, they're likened to seven horns. That's the complete power of God. But the eyes represent his knowledge, his wisdom, his understanding. Um, and it goes all over the world. There's nothing hidden from the eyes of the Lord. And Jesus has those seven spirits. He has the completeness of the spirit of God, whether it's power or whether it's knowledge. It's all in Jesus. And you and I have him. Amen. He has the seven stars. I, I put there on the notes. He's not holding them as in chapter two, verse one. I'm going to read that to you. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, that's two, one. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. He had the control. He, he was the one that held them and you know, uh, protected them and used them and told them what to do. Whereas here, it just says, all right, who has? It doesn't say he's holding them in his hand. They're not in the hollow of his right hand, which the right hand of God always represents righteousness, all right? Okay, let's go to the condition no. All right. I, I want to say here, all right, um, we read it already. I know thy works, that you have a name, that you live, but you are dead. All right. Um, the Lord knows a church, what it does, it is never hidden from his eyes. He's watching all the time. I want you to realize of these seven churches, you can write it down somewhere. Smyrna, that's church number two, and Philadelphia, 
which we haven't talked about yet, is church number six. These two churches receive no condemnation. They receive no blame. They receive no bad report. Smyrna, the suffering church, the persecuted church, and Philadelphia, the church of brotherly love. These are the only two churches where no, no blame is spoken at all. But Sardis, which is number five, all right, and Laodicea, which is the last one, which is number seven, they receive no praise, all right? No praise at all in these two churches. It's very interesting to make note of this, all right? We see here that they have a reputation of life. You have a name. That means you have a reputation for being alive, that you live, that you're... So don't get a picture of this church as being lazy, doing nothing, decadent. No, no, no. Outwardly, they're very vibrant. Outwardly, they're doing works. Outwardly, they're doing this, doing that, doing the other thing. This is the way man sees them, all right? They have a reputation of life, but in God's sight, God saw them as spiritually dead. So uh, they were full of religion. They had come out from under uh, that rule before, all right, tyrannical rule, uh, but they were not inside born again. They didn't have spiritual life. Uh, I read this somewhere and I wrote it down, a perfect model of inoffensive Christianity, a perfect model of inoffensive Christianity. You know, we don't step on anybody's toes. We make sure that uh, everything we say sounds good. It's nice. So, you know, we're not going to offend anybody. Make sure we keep things like that. that. Sardis represents that. All right. But I tell you, sometimes we have to declare what is so, we have to say it out, we have to state it out, all right? Um, let's go under there. They had a profession, but they had no possession, all right? They had a name, which is a reputation of life. The exterior, you, thou livest. That, that was as people saw it, but the interior, you are dead. You'll notice I put an exclamation point there, all right? This is the way Christ saw it. Uh, let's read 1 Samuel 16, 7. This is when God sent Samuel to anoint one of the sons of um. Jesse, I believe this is. Yes. All right. Now, therefore, make a new cart and take two mills. Hey, wait, wait, wait. First Samuel 16, verse 7. 16. First Samuel 16, verse 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Yeah. I'm going to tell you a story. It's just coming to me now, but I asked the Lord to give me illustrations. I remember when somebody suggested for my husband to invite a certain man to come to our church. Our church was small in, in those days, all right? It wasn't a big, huge church. But, um, you know, anyways, uh, my husband invited this preacher to come. And when he came, I, I was a little bit taken aback because he had impediment of speech 
speech, he had something wrong physically whereby uh, he just wasn't normal. And I, I remember when he got up and started speaking and uh, some of his movements, you know, were very awkward. And I thought, what in the world, dad? Why did you invite him to come? But do you know that by the time he finished preaching, the whole church, the power of God had come down, had moved in our midst. Yes, outwardly, he didn't look like somebody you would want to put up in a pulpit. But under the anointing of God, my goodness, the power of God just flowed. People were weeping. People were repenting. People were coming to God. Mighty things were taking place. And, and I realized I had judged by the outer man. And sometimes we think, wow, oh, they're so good. Wow, oh, they're this, they're that. And then you get them and nothing happens. The service is dead as a doornail because inside they have nothing. Outside they, they have everything. So friends, God doesn't look at the outside. He looks at the condition of the heart. And it doesn't matter if outwardly we don't have it all together. If our heart goes after God, that's all that he is concerned with. When his spirit comes on, you forget all about the outward minuses. And you just realize to have God and his power whatever vessel he chooses to go through, all right? So always remember this. Uh, the Lord does not see as man sees. The Lord looks on the outward appearance, but uh, man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart, all right? Okay, how can this be? That's D, all right? By comparison, the Romish night and ignorance, the dark ages, has compared to them, uh, these that have come out, they have enlightenment, they have outward freedom and activity, all right? Uh, let's go over to G. It should be E, I, wow. Can you believe that I can teach for years and not see these mistakes? So I've jumped to G. We left the E out. That's all right. E and F out. Wow. <laughs> that really jumped. Oh, no wonder. I turned the wrong page. Sorry. Okay. We're still on D. How can this be? This is the time in church history that the state churches came into being. All right, state churches like uh, the Church of India, uh, the Church of Rome, the Church of this, the Church of that, you, you know, as for the state. And they were kind of inter um, mingled with the government as well. Nations, entire populations, all right, uh, became unchristianized under that, all right, but they were strict and they were strictly orthodox, all right? They had infant baptism, they had confirmation, all right? And the Lord's Supper, they were zealous for the church and zealous for Christianity, but God sees them as dead, all right? Outwardly, they made disciples. Outwardly, they had disciple cla discipleship classes. Uh, all of that. So they were working hard, but we're going to see later the works are called dead works. All right. So they're dead under number three because they do not have personal faith and communion with the Lord. They're trusting in forms, they're trusting in ceremonies. All right, they have this birthright membership. In other words, 
uh, they're born into the church. They're born into a family. I was born into a Christian family, but thank God my mother knew that I needed to be born again, you know, and I remember I was either five or six when I really prayed the prayer for Jesus to come into my heart, all right, instead of the new birth. Now, Jesus says here in John 1, 12 and 13, would you read that to us? Yes, John 1, verse 12 and 13. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Yeah, so uh, when it says they were born not of blood, in other words, you're not a Christian because you're born into a Christian family. That's what that means, not of blood, all right? Nor of the will of flesh. You're, you know, it's not because you decide I'm gonna be a Christian. I, okay, I'll take all the studies and I'll quickly get baptized, then I'll be a Christian and my name will go in the member. No, 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 it's not the will of the flesh, nor the will of man. Nobody can force you. They might uh, put your name down, but you're not, a, you're, they're born of God. It has to be a God thing that takes place. Uh, an encounter with God where he literally changes us, creates us as his child. So it's religion versus relationship they're dead because they don't have a living relationship they have all the outward forms of religion they brought all that with them and they don't have one man telling them what to do but they're just as dead as if they were still under all of that all right because they're not born again Notice verse 12, as many as received him. Did we really receive Jesus? And, and again, I'm reminded of what um, Robert Morris, under the gateway uh, churches, if you've heard his own testimony, I've seen it several times, and he will remind us that he grew up in a Christian family. He grew up from young going to church, but he was not truly born again till he was 19 years old. And he says it was in a, uh, when you travel a motel, uh, somebody evidently led him to the Lord there. And that's when he first, he said, I, I used to go down to the altar, but nothing would take place. My life never changed. But he said, when that day I realized I have to personally receive him into my life, personally acknowledge that I am a sinner and I need to be changed. And he said, that day I was born again. And from then on, God's spirit began to deal with me, talk with me, show me he said, I still had problems that I had to work through, but now I'm in tune with God and he can help me. Okay, so I, I say this because maybe, you know, I, I don't care how long you've been in church. If you have never acknowledged you are a sinner and you need to be born again, Jesus said, except you're born again, you can't. And Let's read that. That's the next one. John 3, 3. Um, and 5. Yes. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Yeah, one says to see it, even to understand it, even to really know what it's talking about, spiritual understanding, unless you're born again and you want to enter into the kingdom of God, you have to, all right, not only be born of water, not only go through water baptism, but you have to 
be born of the spirit, an internal work done. You can go do all the externals, but if you don't have the internal, it's not going to help you, all right? Um, let's read now. Um, con the condemnation is verse two, Revelation 3, 2. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that, that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Yeah, I have not found your works perfect before God. They might be okay for man's eyes. Maybe you have a good reputation, but he's saying be watchful. All right, start being on guard. Be careful. Uh, they're not, it's not a hopeless case yet. There's still hope that things can be strengthened. All right. There are a few things that remain, but they're also ready to die. So let's look here. The, the, the condemnation works not perfect before God. I put their works are very important. All right. Every church you will find works are mentioned. I know thy works. I know thy works. So God is seen. But, you know, as a child of God, you're not just to sit and shake a leg. It, it is not just let the pastor do all the works. Let the, you know, the ministries do the work. No, every true child of God, every member of the body of Christ, if we're born again, it is to do works, and the Lord is looking at those works. Now, B, under E2, small b, why are they not perfect before God? Hebrews 9, 14, and 15. Yes. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Yeah. So it says that your conscience might be purged from dead works. That means when you're dead, before the Lord, all right? It says dead in trespasses and sins. Then any works you do, I don't care how religious they look, they're dead works because they're done by dead people, spiritually dead people. Only when you're washed in the blood and made and created a brand new person in Christ, then what you do by faith becomes living works, all right? You do it in obedience to the Lord. You do it, all right? Um, without faith, it's impossible to please him. So any works that are done not by faith, but just by human self-effort are dead works as well. Uh, notice under C, there is going to be a judgment of works. Revelation 2, 23. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Mm. So, um, you know, if your works are dead works, then you are going to be, go to the second death. That's what we already talked about that one um, uh, under... Thyatira, I believe, all right? Either that or Pergamos, I'm not sure, but I, I think it's Thyatira. It says, they're all going to know that I'm the one that searches the reins. That means your motivations and what your heart really loves. It's There's going to be a judgment of works, all right? Everyone, uh, whether good or bad, whether believers or non-believers, each one has their own place of judgment of works, all right? 
Let, let's go to the next one. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 10 to 15. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. All right. So th this is telling us that um, the foundation, of course, is Jesus. And then you and I begin to build. He's our foundation. There is no other foundation. But we need to be careful how we build this spiritual building, this spiritual life on this foundation. All right. 11 and 12. First Corinthians 3, 11 and 12. Yes, for, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. 14 and 15. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Yeah. So it, it really pays that we walk by faith. And like Jesus said, don't do anything unless you hear it from God or see it. He's the one that motivates you to do, because if you just get your own ideas and, and, and do your own thing, when that judgment of works comes, God's nature is fire. And when our works go through the fire here in verse 12, if it's gold, silver, precious stones, that it will be purified. It will come out pure. All right. But if it, the works are of wood, merely human, hay or stubble, which is useless, worthless, but it's all just human actions and human ways, no, it'll be burned up. The fire will just burn it up. And even though we make it to heaven, we will have nothing to show for it. Everything will be gone. All right. So works are very important. All right. Um, let, let's go to the loving council. Wow. This is actually a good time. To, maybe we should just stop here. It's uh, just two minutes before. I really would like to complete Sardis today, but we'll stop here uh, and come back in 10 minutes time. Uh, it's uh, 58, so 10.08. Oh. All right. <laughs> Okay, let's start with um, page 20, the loving council, that's F. Verse three, Revelation 3, three, Sister Twine. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. All right. Uh, I don't know what you feel, but just looking at that verse, when it says, I will come on you as a thief if you don't watch. All right. Uh, it, it, it's saying that when Jesus comes in the rapture, all right, 
uh, they're not going to know it. It'll be like a thief. He comes and catches his bride away, and, and then they wake up. Whoa! What happened? What? Where, where did they go? What? You know? And there, you will be left behind. So I see here. This is loving counsel to prepare them and realize Jesus when he comes. He's not going to blow a trumpet. I mean, I'm talking about the rapture. When he comes halfway and we're caught up to meet him, um, you know, you, you're either looking for him, you are ready for him, you're waiting for him to come anytime. So when he comes, you're not caught off guard. All right. So it says, remember how you received. How did they receive? How each and every one truly receives it's by grace it's not your own efforts it's not righteousness by self work self effort all right uh let, let's read that ephesians 2 8 and 9 for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of god not of works lest any man should boast so grace, I told you, is the life of God, God's ability, all right, coming into you. So that's how we're saved. We don't deserve it. And you only receive it by faith. And even the faith, it says, it's not you trying to believe. It's a gift of God. God gives you the, when he sees in your heart, you really want something. He'll drop the faith in there to be able to receive it. If you're just chin chai, half hearted, no, he's not going to give you the faith. But if you mean it with all of your heart, what you're praying for, what you're desiring, you know, and he sees that desire you really want. And, you know, you can't do it, but you long for him to do it. He'll drop his faith in there. So when it says that not of yourselves, it's talking about the faith. It's a gift of God. Then it says, not of works. It's not how hard you work, not how zealous you look outwardly, not by your efforts, all right? Because otherwise we can boast. I pray so many hours a day. I read the Bible so many hours. A day. Do you know how many hours I serve the church? Do you know how many hours I'm out there, you know? Um, doing whatever he wants me to do. I heard a testimony um, in the middle of the night when I got up, uh, somebody had come to our house and uh, we had bought a machine that, you know, uh, puts oxygen into your water. And um, he, he told this, uh, testimony concerning his own mother, all right? His mother, uh, when she went to the doctor, she found, just for a regular checkup, but they found out that she had almost like terminal cancer, and she was given very little time to live. But he said his mother had always been uh, she loved to witness to people, loved to tell people about Jesus and so forth. And so the moment she found out she only had very short time to live, um, you know, she went to the wards and she began witnessing to people, telling of the goodness of God and so forth. And uh, he said to her, Mom, what are you doing? You're just told you don't have much time to live. And she said, that's it. I don't have much time to live. And I don't want to waste my time doing other things. I just want to tell about Jesus till my last breath. All right. I don't know if that's exactly because I was told uh, the story. And so I'm just putting it the way that I figure it must have been. But I was very touched by that uh, testimony of this lady that, Instead of starting to feel sorry for herself, all she could think of was, if I don't have much time to live, I want to use as much time as I have just to share Jesus with people. And it wasn't she was only starting then. She had a lifetime. That was the way she lived her life. 
but at this time, you know, so I, I think we just have to realize how did we receive, remember what we've received, it was by grace, not of works, uh, Hebrews 10, 32. But call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions. Yeah, so illuminated, that means, you know, it isn't just you heard a message, okay, I want to be a Christian. The Spirit of God revealed Jesus to you, and you saw, you realized spiritually, you understand what it's all about, all right? Um, and once they knew the truth, they endured a great fight of affliction. So what I'm trying to tell you is it's not just an outward religious thing, all right? How did they hear? They heard in faith. Let's uh, look there, Galatians 3, 2 to 5. Galatians 3, verse 2 to 5. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish, having begun in the spirit? Are ye now made perfect by the flesh? All right, let, let's stop. Um, many of us who are born again, we know that it's God only that can make us born again. None of us could do that ourselves to remove our sin and become a brand new creation in Christ that we know it took the spirit of God to do that. But some of us don't realize after you receive Jesus, we have to continue to walk by faith. All right. You can't suddenly now. And like I've, I've mentioned it many times in my different teachings, how, you know, I look back now and I can see that at that time I was still uh, it was partially works because when my husband would call me, you know, he wanted uh, so-and-so come up here to be prayed for. Then he'd call the board members to come up to help pray. And then he'd say, Sister Seward, you come also. And as I'm walking down the aisle, I still remember sometimes those thoughts. Did, did I pray enough today? Is my prayer going to be answered? That's works has nothing to do with how much you prayed, whether your prayers are going to be answered or not. It's by faith. It's keeping, not looking at yourself. Do I qualify? Am I doing the right thing? I'm not saying about sin. Sin is sin, but I'm just talking about uh, good works, good works. Don't look at yourself. Keep your eyes on the Lord, all right? And once we start, it takes the Holy Spirit to continue all the way. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on the Father, all right? Four and five. Yes. Have ye suffered so many things in vain? If it be yet in vain, he therefore that minister to you the Spirit and the worketh, and worketh miracles among you, Doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Yeah. The works of the law are your good works, your good efforts, all right? Is that what causes miracles to happen? Or is it you hear God talk to you, you hear him tell you what to do, and when you obey him, then God performs the miracle. It's called the hearing of faith, all right? But we need to realize it's not only the hearing of faith, it is a walk of faith. That means day by day. It's not just once in a blue moon. It's every day walking by faith. So it says, hold fast. Hold fast what? Justification by faith. All right. Just as if you never sinned uh, because you believed in the finished work of Calvary. You believed in Jesus and what he did. You believe in the person of Jesus Christ, that he had no sin. Therefore, he could take our place. Our eyes are on Jesus. 
Uh, we're justified by faith. We're not justified because of what we do and what we know. Let's look at Hebrews 10, 35 to 38. Hebrews 10, verse 35 to 38. <clears throat> Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. All right. When it says no pleasure in him, it reminds me without faith, it is impossible to please God. All right. So don't start by faith and then start thinking it has to do with you. The devil's trick is to keep your eyes on yourself. Don't let him do that. Turn your eyes away from self. Keep your eyes on Jesus. All right. It says, don't cast away your confidence or your assurance. Your confidence is in who Jesus is, what he has done for you. It is not in yourself. Not only that, you need to be able to endure to the end. It's not he that starts well but he who ends well. It says it's going to be a little while before Jesus is going to come, but he is going to come. So it doesn't matter. For us now, it's been 2,000 years over. And you can, the devil can say, ah, he's not going to come. Yes, he is. If it was the last days 2,000 years ago, we're living in the last of the last days he could come just any time. And therefore, we don't just start by faith. We live by faith every moment. And once it says, if any man draw back, you want to go back by living by your five senses. You want to go back by pleasing yourself, doing what you want to do, what you think is right, instead of following the Lord, then God isn't going to have pleasure in you. Don't turn away from walking by faith. Every step needs to be by faith, by faith. And that's keeping your eyes on the person of Jesus, who he is and what he has done. What he represents, he's the only one who was the sinless one. He's the only one that could take our place because everybody else had sin. Amen. So keep your eyes on him. He accomplished it and God received it. So, um, so then the Lord tells this church, Sardis, repent, all right? And I've given you a definition here of what repent is. Stop, turn about face, and go the other way. Whatever they were doing that God said was wrong, they were just doing it on their own strength, their own efforts, very busy, very workaholics, religiously minded, but they were not doing it according to God's way. So stop, turn about face, and go the other way towards God. Turn from flesh, that means doing it yourself, to spirit, the works the works that come from the works of the flesh, self-effort, all right? Turn back to faith, all right? Turn from self to Christ. That's what I mean by what I've written there. From are the first words, to are the second words, all right? Philippians 3.3, 3, would you read that for us? Yes. Philippians 3, verse 3. For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Okay, so I, on my own notes, I put here acceptable worship is not outward formality. You can sing loud, you can sing long periods of time, 
That is not acceptable worship. We are the circumcision. Now, you see, in those days, the Jews were called circumcision. They had that outward sign. All right. But he is saying, actually, uh, in another place, he says, you're not a Jew outwardly, but you're a Jew inwardly. All right. So we are the true circumcision, which worship God in the spirit, not just outward formality. And we rejoice in Christ Jesus. All right. Our rejoicing, our pride, our boasting is in Jesus Christ. It's all about him. And we have no confidence in the flesh. We're not bragging or showing off or trying to prove anything of what we can do. No, our worship is in the realm of the spirit with our eyes on Jesus Christ. All right. Uh, let's go to page 21G. All right. God warns to avert, all right, this is going back to Revelation 3, 2. Would you read that, please? Sure, Sister Morgan. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not, I have not found thy works perfect before God. Yeah, so it's very clear. He, he is not giving them any, um, you know, patting them on the back. He says, no, he says, your works are not perfect before God. Maybe they're okay for man. Maybe man thinks it's all right. So he says, be watchful and strengthen those things. It's a warning. And that's why I put here, God warns to avert, to keep you from ending up in the wrong place. All right. Um, let, let's see here. God's progressive dealings, 1 Corinthians 11, 31, and 32. Okay. 1 Corinthians, verse 11, 31, and 32. <clears throat> For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the word with the world. Yeah. So you see, actually, don't wait for God to say, stop that. According to the word of God, as you daily read the word of God, the word will convict you. If you're a true born again believer, the word will convict you if there's any part of your life that's not in keeping with the word. As you read it, God's spirit will cause that word to enter your spirit. So then you need to judge yourself, all right? Don't wait to be judged because if you're judged, in other words, you wait till God judges you, he'll first judge you by chastening you, all right? Smacking I don't know if you believe in that when you raise children. We don't want to do it just of our own accord, but for the children's sake, they need to, when they're determined to do things their own way, that they need to have more than just talking to. If they continue on, then you need to smack them, all right, to, to learn. And it says the reason God will chasten us, all right, is so we will not be condemned with the world. He doesn't want you to end up being judged with the world because there's no hope for the world. All right. We are his children. He will chasten us. If you still don't listen, then, well, you're going to end. And that's what he told me that time when he told me to stop and uh, I better change. I better go back to my husband and admit my wrong and never do it again. Because he said, you're going in the wrong direction. The road you're walking on, the way you're walking and doing is not going to heaven. The end of that type of living is ending up in hell. 
So he really spoke clear, loud and clear to me. And praise God, it worked. All right. Um, he whether I, I don't he never chastened me. All right. But he he spoke very clearly to me because I thought it was all right to get angry over little things and, and you know, do this, do that, do that. No, he said, you stop it. Don't you do that ever again. Very clear and loud. All right. So I'm glad he's a God who warns us. Look, look at your paper there under 1 Corinthians 11. Warns us, then judges, then chastens. But if we don't pay attention to the chastening, uh, comes condemnation. Yeah, it'll be condemnation. If, if he continues to tell you, then, and you don't listen, but I put under B, he warns before he judges. But if we will learn to judge ourselves according to the word of God, if the, you know, when I was younger, uh, in my teens and like that, when I read the Bible, I knew to read it every day. My mother had devotions with us clear till we left home, but I did my own Bible reading also. And when I would read it, many times I would say, whoa, that's not like me. What are you doing? You're judging the word of God by yourself instead of, whoa, the word of God says, don't do it. But you're doing it, so you better stop. But no, I, I, did, I didn't understand that. I don't know how I was so blind. And that's why the Lord had to speak so strongly to me, all right? But I realized later he was doing it because he loved me. You keep going this way. You think you're on your road to heaven. <clears throat> but this kind of behavior, if you continue it once in a while, then repent. But to continue in that behavior, you're going to end up in hell. That's just exactly what he said. So we need to realize that's where the flesh is going to take us. All right. Number two, under G, God warns to avert. God's judgment is true. He sees beneath the surface. He sees behind the label. You know, you label. I'm a good Christian. I'm a Bible school student. I'm a pastor. I'm a missionary. I was a missionary when he spoke to me, but he saw behind the label. Missionaries will make it to heaven. No, they won't if they keep going their own way. Yeah. So he sees behind the label. He knows what the true situation is. So God offers a choice. And he says here, if. All right, that's verse three. Shall we read that? Yes, Sister Margaret. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Yeah, so it's saying here that he offers us a choice. If shows the condition, all right? If you do not watch, then I'll come on you as a thief. If you're watchful, careful, judge yourself, let the word of God be that which, by which you judge yourself. Don't judge yourself by, by your natural mind of condemnation. Condemnation comes from the devil. Conviction comes from the Holy Spirit, all right? And when it's the word of God, judged by that, it will convict you. You'll look to God and say, I'm sorry, Lord. I see I'm doing like this, but your word says I shouldn't. Please forgive me and get it right and keep going, all right? So <clears throat> two ways are clearly shown. And the outcome is clearly shown. <clears throat> this is taking us back to verse two. Be watchful 
and strengthen our watch. The definition is keep awake. It's talking <clears throat> about spiritually. <coughs> spiritually awake, spiritually alert, spiritually vigilant, spiritually prepared, all right? Uh, the base root word is collecting one's faculties, all right? When you go to sleep, you don't know what's going on, all right? But to awaken, to arouse from sleep, that's the root, base root word. To arouse from disease, to arouse from death, all right? Number two, scriptural examples which warn. Matthew 24, 42 to 44. Okay. Matthew 24, starting from verse 42. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the son of man cometh. Yeah, so it's telling us here, if, you know, if he comes as a thief, thieves don't warn you. Thieves don't prepare you. You have to be ready for the thief, have things ready. So if a thief comes in, the alarm goes off. This happens. You have to be prepared so no thief can get in. But it says he wouldn't have allowed his house to be broken up. That means when Jesus comes, if he catches some away and some are left behind, not everybody goes up because they're not all prepared. It says, so we need to be ready at all times. Whether you're asleep physically or awake physically, you're ready that should he come morning, noon, or night, you are ready <clears throat> to be caught up <clears throat> to meet the Lord in the air. Let's go to that fifth, uh, 45 to 51. <clears throat> who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily, I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. All right, so th this is showing two types of servants and it's likening us to be a servant. If we're faithful and we're wise, all right, we will be doing what God wants us to do, our daily lifestyle. We're not talking about whether you're in church or not, all right? Our daily living, whether it's in the four walls of your house or whether it's on the street or on the MRT or wherever you are, your daily living, all right? <clears throat> God has made each and every one of us to be rulers in his household and to give meat in due season, to make sure that we give out Christ and we feed people on Christ. His life should be in us and being shown forth out of us. So it says, if we're living like that, a Christ life, Christ like life, all right, in love and like that, well, when he comes, he will reward us. But if we're a servant, that means we claim to believe in Jesus, 
We claim to be serving the Lord, but we don't really think about his coming. We say, well, you know, it's okay. I, I've been baptized, I this, that, the other. And as if that excuses us to live any old how, and we begin to, verse 49, have excessive living, and we begin to live as the world lives, rather than coming out of the world, set apart unto the Lord, all right? It says, when the Lord comes, though we claim to be his child, though we claim to be his servant, um, we will be counted as a hypocrite because we claim one thing, but live another. And it says there will be weeping and it means you'll go to hell. All right, if really we are the servants of God, and this doesn't mean you have to be a pastor, a teacher, but it means your lifestyle should be sharing Christ, showing love, showing concern, Whatever we do, we do it in the way that God would have it done. All right. Okay. Um, let's look at the Luke 12, 46 says, uh, we will end up with the unbelievers. All right. Uh, would you read that Luke 12, 46? The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Mm. See, very clearly, the Lord of that servant, we're going to end up with the unbelievers. That's what I said about 51, but that's when it's talked about in uh, Matthew. But here in Luke, it says very clearly, he will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Because if you really are born again and you're walking according to the spirit, then the life of Jesus will be exemplified. Friends, please don't trust in how many years you've gone to church. Don't trust in is your name in the church records. Have you been baptized in water? All those things are a one-time thing. It's walking by faith, allowing the life of Christ to be visible and seen by others. And when we fall and yield to the flesh, recognize it, stop, repent, ask God to forgive and get back on track again. Amen. All right. Uh, I've given us here the... Matthew 25, about the five foolish virgins, all right, and the five that were wise. Let, let's read that. You, you go verse by verse, and I will, yeah. Matthew 25. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five, and five of them were wise and five were foolish. Now, all of them are virgins, all right? All of them had lamps. All of them were waiting to meet the bridegroom. Understand that. But it's telling us very clearly, some were wise. They knew what the Lord wanted. Some were foolish. They didn't seem to understand what it meant to be a child of God, all right? Number three and four. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Okay, <clears throat> those that were foolish didn't understand that to keep the light burning, they needed oil. Oil definitely represents the Holy Spirit. All right. So don't think you can start off good and, and no, if you're really wanting to be the bride of Christ, all right, then you need to know to keep your lamp burning, it's going to take the work of the Holy Spirit. And remember, Jesus died 
not only to forgive your sins, but that you might receive the promise of the Father. That's Galatians 3, 13 and 14. It's in 14, actually. Uh, he died that we might receive uh, Abraham's promise that justification by faith, that's getting saved. And he also died that we might receive the promise of the Father, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so the foolish did not take extra oil, but the wise ones took oil in their vessels. All right. Now, verse five. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. All right. And, and this is not saying they should have been. You have to rest. There comes a time. So both they, they slumbered and they slept. But those that are prepared, let's go to six now, six and seven. And at midnight, there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, give us of your oil for our lamps are gone out. Yeah, they're gone out or going out. All right. So they realize uh, the foolish now they hear he's coming. All right. And, and so as they're trimming and getting those lamps ready, they say, whoa, we need we need oil. They hadn't brought oil with them. So when they suddenly wake up to realize they want the wise people to give them, give us of your oil. What do, do the wise answer? Nine. But the wise answered saying, not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. You know, you might think at first, those wise were mean. They were, no, no, no. <clears throat> Literally speaking, I cannot give you of my, the spirit of God, and you cannot give of me. We each have to get our own from the Lord. I can tell you about it. I can share with you about it, but I cannot take from mine and give it to you. No, there is no such a thing. All right. So don't, don't use your natural head and say, how mean were they? Uh, in the story, they said, there won't be enough for us and you. You need to go to them that sell. You need to buy for yourself. When you buy something, it costs you. There's a price to pay. And that's what this is saying, all right? You go out and buy for yourself. Verse 10, what happens when they go to buy? The foolish. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to, to the marriage. And the door was shut. Yeah, the door to the marriage was shut. The marriage is talking about <clears throat> the bride and the bridegroom getting married. All right. It was shut to these that were foolish. Because when they came back, <clears throat> go ahead. Verse 11. Afterward came also the other virgin saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Yeah. So when it says, I know you not, we, we could say, Oh, that for this occasion, for the wedding, I don't know you. All right. You're not part of this. That's what the foolish were told. They. I really believe they're going to, unless their light was totally gone out, but I believe where it says our lights are gone out is they're going out, all right? We need the power of the spirit. So don't put it off. Don't say I've been a Christian long, how long? And I've never been baptized in the spirit. It's so important to depend upon the Holy Spirit. And if Jesus died, <clears throat> that the promise of the Father might be given to you and given to me, then who are we?
to turn around and say, I don't need it. I can get along without it. Don't be foolish. If you want to part, if you want to be there at the time that the wedding of the bride and the groom, Jesus is taking a bride for himself. And I don't know why I never intended to, but I'm going to say it here, friends. If Adam is the first man, all right, the first, the head of the race, when God gave him a bride, did he take the whole body of Adam and make the woman? Did he? No. He took one rib out of the body and made the bride. Eve was made out of one rib of the entire body. That tells me the whole body, all every person that is a member, no, they're not going to be the bride. I, I'm sorry. All right. And if we want to have a part in all of this and we want to be there, we want to witness it, but we want to be the bride, you must be baptized in the Holy Spirit. All right. The bride will be full of the spirit of God. Not everybody that's baptized in the spirit will be part of the bride because of their daily living. I, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit when the Lord spoke strongly to me that day. All right. I was driving. Where are you going? What do you mean? I don't know where I'm going. I mean, are you going to heaven or hell? Of course I'm going to heaven. No, you're not, he said. You keep going on this road, you're not. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, but I chose to walk after the flesh. I didn't understand what the Bible was talking about. Not that I couldn't have understood it. I went through Bible school. All right, but it, I still did not. You can go through Bible school. You can have degrees. You can have titles. That doesn't mean you are spiritually illuminated. It's only when your heart is going after him. Oh, friends, how can I, how can I stress it more than that? And, and if you don't sense that, then tell the Lord. Say, Lord, give me a heart to want you more than I want myself. Give me a heart to chase after you. Give me a heart that longs for you. He will do it if you want that. All right? Okay, so he, he says, I, I don't know you. You're, you're not part of this. You're not going to have a part of this. And I'm here to tell you, friends, when we get it, starting in chapter four and five, we're going to find out there are people up there. They're given, they have thrones to sit on. They have crowns on their head. Definitely the rapture has taken place between chapter, th the end of chapter three and chapter four. The rapture has taken place. Otherwise, people wouldn't have crowns and people wouldn't have thrones to sit on. All right. And if we and before that can happen, all right, Jesus is going to marry his bride. Because the bride is coming back with him when he comes to uh, do his day of wrath. We're come. The bride comes back with him. Oh, friends, uh, we don't have much time. And, and I would start praying, if you have never been baptized in the spirit, instead of saying, oh, well, that's just a Pentecostal. No, it's not a Pentecostal doctrine. It's the word of the living God. It's in God's word. The whole New Testament was written by people that had been baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke with other tongues. Every author in the New Testament had been baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke with other tongues. And unless you have, you cannot really interpret it properly because only the Holy Spirit can quote his and give us the right meaning. So I, I don't know why I've, you know, he's coming very soon. 
don't put it off. Don't put it off. Don't be like the foolish virgin, all right, that doesn't have the oil. And by the time you realize you need it, it's too late and that occasion is gone. You might make it to heaven because we see other people getting to heaven, but they didn't go up in the rapture, all right? I beg of you to think about it. it. Verse 13 says, watch therefore, for you know not neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. All right. Um, okay. We're going to stop here and we'll start next time with I, Christ coming as a thief and finish. This um, probably will only take us from here to the end. It will take us at least at the first hour next week. So Lord willing, we will finish Sardis at the end of the first hour. And we will start the second hour with Philadelphia. All right. So be sure you come back. Let, let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. All right. Um, I'm not just praying out of formality. Uh, I've had a few testimonies, <clears throat> written testimonies come in. Uh, the latest one was on Tuesday when we were, you know, talking about healing. And then we prayed for people that needed to be healed. And uh, in, in one of the classes at the end, we prayed for everyone and then this lady wrote and said she had had some kind of pain for years and nobody the doctors didn't seem to be able to help her at all and she might have to go through surgery in order to get help and in the end after that the prayer she said the pain went away and it had never come back again she was completely healed by Jesus, yes, so we give, give the Lord a hand, that's right, praise the Lord, he deserves all the praise, so bow your heads right now, Father, today we've been talking about Sardis, who was a church that had a name that they were alive, they had a reputation that they were living, they were very uh, full of works, Full of works, but they were dead works. They didn't really have a born again experience. And then we've also talked about people that truly are born again because they're called virgins, but they aren't baptized in the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray right now, you see out of all these that have attended the class today, 700 plus, maybe eight, I don't know for sure. But Lord, you see their hearts. You see their longings. You see their desires. Lord, we don't want you to come upon us as a thief, that you catch us unaware and that you come and go and we're not even aware of it until it's all over. And we miss that wonderful rapture that you have for us. I pray, oh God, that we will keep our lights burning by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we will keep walking by faith and not turn again to walking by sight, not turn again to just doing our own thing and looking at ourselves and getting condemned. No, Lord, help us to keep our eyes on you. Help us, Lord, to behold you in your glory, in all of your beauty, to long after you, to cry after you, to be warned of you, to be alerted by you, to be strengthened by you, to be filled by you, to be strengthened by you. Yes, and to be healed by you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lay your hand 
upon those that you see their heart is crying out to you. And grant the longing of their heart, the longing of their soul, by revealing yourself to them, Lord. By making yourself real to them, that by faith, they can give good testimony that they had a touch from heaven, a touch from your hand. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. See you next week, Lord willing. Those that are on Tuesday, we'll see you Tuesday or Thursday or Saturday. Amen. Bye-bye.